You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. So if we're talking about the life of the believer, God sees some things in our lives, and we all have it. I do. Little offshoots, they start growing, and God says, oh, I got to cut that out. That's not good for your walk. I, I need to prune that. The word here actually is carthio. We think of carterizing. It comes kind of from a root word of that in the original language, to cut, to purge, to cleanse. And God is faithful to cut, to purge, to cleanse, to cut off those things in our life that would harm us. He, he loves us so much because he knows what the effect could be. Have you ever noticed how fast a weed can grow? One day you see a small sprout in your backyard, but you suddenly have a bigger and faster growing problem after a few days. The same is true when it comes to the sin in our lives. It can start as a sip of alcohol, a text message, or a phone call, but suddenly turn into a bigger problem. Today, Pastor Ron will encourage you to cut sin from the moment it enters your heart. Don't allow your sinful nature to grow and fester. Ask God to remove it from the source. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of John chapter 15 as he begins his message, Abiding in the Vine. Take out your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And always excited when we begin a new chapter. And we're going to be looking at the first 11 verses and just a fantastic passage. So that said, let's pray. Lord, we're just so thankful that we worship an awesome God, that uh, as we think about who you are, what a wonderful name, what a powerful name is the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord. It's amazing grace that you saved us. You've broken the chains of bondage in our life and given us new life. And now, Lord, we can enjoy this new life and this relationship with you. And you tell us in this passage we're going to look at today that you are the vine and we're the branches. And it's essential, absolutely essential that we abide in you, for without you we can do absolutely nothing. And so, Lord, we ask that you would minister to our hearts, show us if there's things that have been clogging up uh, the branch, Lord, something in our lives that's keeping us from experiencing full and, and abundant fruit. And, and, Lord, I also pray, just as we're, our eyes are closed right now and as we're in praying, maybe you're here today and you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ. I just want you to know that the Lord loves you, and, and this passage here speaks of the relationship he wants to have with you and how essential and how important that is. I pray that you would consider today surrendering your heart to him. So, Lord, we give you this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. So, again, John 15, and we're continuing our study through the Gospel of John that we've entitled Identity because it's all about revealing the true identity of Jesus. And, again, we see this other side of Jesus as he calls himself the vine in verses 1 through 11. He actually calls himself the vine, the father, the vine dresser, and then we are the branches. In verse 4, if you jump down there, he says, abide in me. How important it is we abide, remain, stay in Christ. So that said, we've entitled our message this morning, Abiding in the Vine. We'll divide this passage into two main thoughts, but we'll first of all look at how important it is to abide in Christ. That's essential, in fact. And then secondly, we'll look at the benefits of abiding in the latter part. But first of all, in the first six verses, Jesus is introducing this concept, and he talks about the importance of abiding in him. Now, he begins by saying, I am the true vine. So this is now the seventh I am statement in the Gospel of John. Now, there are many other times that Jesus uses this term I am. And of course, he talks about I am the way and the truth. I am the resurrection of life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd and so forth. But every time he uses that term I am, it's a declaration of deity. This is the same term by which God presented himself to Moses in the burning bush when God called and revealed himself to Moses to be the deliverer. Uh, Moses says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am who I am. And then throughout the Old Testament, we have God using this term. And then, of course, then Jesus uses this term, and the people understood exactly what he's saying. And what he's saying here, he's saying, I am God, the true vine. Now, as he brings up this analogy of a vine, a vineyard, and so forth. This would have been readily understood by the disciples. And again, he's in the upper room. Chapters 13 through 17 are one passage. Jesus is in the upper room. Just hours when he's done speaking, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and then he's arrested. He goes to the cross. So he's giving them last-minute instruction. 
But as he's talking to them, they would have understood what it meant when he says, I'm the vine, because God used this many times in the Old Testament. For example, in the the book of Isaiah, in chapter 5, God refers to Israel as his vine, his vineyard. He says, my well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. And God dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted in it the choicest of vines. He even built a tower in it. He also made a wine press, and he expected it to bring forth good grapes. And so here's this beautiful picture. God said, I've done everything for my people Israel, and I've protected them and walled them in and and the choicest of vines, and I expect good grapes. But he said it it brought forth wild grapes. And of course, he goes on to speak about the rebellion of Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 21, God says, I planted you, Israel, a noble vine, the highest of quality. So uh, the Israelites, the Jews, understood this analogy, and now Jesus is saying, I'm I'm the vine. Now, I love the fact that he says, I'm the true vine, because there are other vines. There are false vines. There are other vines that seek to attract men to themselves, to attach themselves to, to somehow find fulfillment. And unfortunately, people attach themselves to it all the time. Some people cling to the vine of possessions, right? Or it's their bank account. Or they cling to a vine of a a relationship. For some, it's a vine of education. For others, it's a vine of popularity. Some even attach themselves to the church. If I just attach myself to some church or religious organization, therefore, I'm okay, I'm moral, I'm fine. But listen, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't bring the life of God into your your heart. It's being attached to Jesus. Jesus then says, I am the true vine. So Jesus introduces this concept, I'm the true vine. Then he says, and my father is the vine dresser. Now we understand that. We might say the gardener, the one who's tending the vineyard. We understand that then. Of course, as, as a gardener, as one who would come then to a vineyard, he has really two things that he does when he comes to the vine in regard to the branches. If he finds a branch that is dead, well, the first thing he's going to do is remove it. But then when the vine dresser comes to the vine, he also sees the, the, the connected branches, but he might see some offshoots. You know what he does to them? He prunes them. He cuts them away as well. Because they could be taking life from the greater flow of sap and life that would be bringing more fruit. So the vine dresser takes away, prunes away, and Jesus talks about this in verse 2. He speaks of the Father as the vine dresser, and then he says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, that's the Father, takes away. By the way, what does the Father do with them? Well, jump down to verse 6, if you would, real quick. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. You know, branches from a, from a vine are really, you can't, they can't, they're not good for building material. They usually, usually use it for kindling. And if you've got a vineyard, you've got a lot of it, you just burn it. And really what he's talking about here is, is judgment, eternal separation from God. That's That's radical. Yes, hence the importance of not being connected to religion or being connected to other things, but being connected to Jesus Christ, the true vine. So understand, in this passage, when Jesus talks about those that are connected to the vine, but they're taken away, he's talking about people who could appear to be saved. They could be externally connected to the vine, but in reality aren't born again. And keep in mind, this would have been fresh in the mind of the disciples because Judas has just departed the upper room. He just left. And certainly Jesus is referring to him. He appeared to be saved. He appeared to be connected. He was part of the 12, but it was a superficial connection. He was not a believer. And then, of course, we have many other passages where Jesus spoke of this, none of them so radical as found in the Sermon on the Mount. As Jesus is closing the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 and verse 22, he says, many will say to me in that day, and what day is that? Well, at the end of the age, when they stand before the Lord, hey, I'm ready for my rewards, I'm ready to go into heaven, and they'll say, Lord, Lord, hey, Jesus, here I am. Didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? And I did miracles and wonders in your name. But Jesus will say, depart from me, I I never knew you. 
We didn't have a relationship. So there was obviously some kind of connection, an external connection, a religious connection, but no life-saving connection. So understand, a fruitless branch, in regard to this analogy, is a Judas branch. It is ultimately cut off. That's radical. So that's how he deals with those that are cut off. Now, how does God deal with the believer, though? Those that are actually attached to the vine that have life. Look again at verse 2. And he says, and every branch that bears fruit, that would be the believer, he prunes. He cuts it as well. Why? That it may bear more fruit. So if we're talking about the life of the believer, God sees some things in our lives, and we all have it. I do. Little offshoots. They start growing. And God says, oh, I got to cut that out. That's not good for your walk. I, I need to prune that. The word here actually is carthio. We think of carterizing. It comes kind of from a root word of that in the original language, to cut, to purge, to cleanse. And God is faithful to cut, to purge, to cleanse, to cut off those things in our life that would harm us. He, he loves us so much because he knows what the effect could be. In another analogy, but it's very similar, uh, Jesus says, don't you know a little leaven, which is yeast, leavens the whole lump. You take a little bit of yeast, you put it in the kneaded in the bread, but it affects all of it. And so in the same way, there are things that we might allow to be attached to our life, and we need to cut it off because it's taking away the life of God. And God will cut out things that we don't always understand. Why well, you cut this out, God? Could be a relationship. Man, that was the one. I knew that guy was the one. Man, I wish he was the one. But God says he wasn't the one. Or she was the one. God says, no, I have something better for you. Or maybe it's a job opportunity. I knew this was the job. It's hard. I know we've had several men that I've been praying for in our fellowship that have been out of work for a long period of time, and something comes along, and boy, I have a, man, I, I mean, there's a lot of guys I've been, there's a good, a good handful of them I've been praying for for a while, and, and one just recently got a job, moved there, went there, and after two weeks, the whole thing was, wasn't what it was said, and he had to come back, and that's even harder. But I was able to say to him, I know that obviously God has something better in mind. God never takes away something without replacing with it something better. That's the nature of our God and how he works. But you, sometimes we're wondering, why are you taking this away? And God says, no, I'm cutting it out. And when God cuts it out or cuts it away, don't be discouraged. He knows what he's doing. He will only take away those things he knows really won't produce fruit in our life, but that can actually do us harm. I mean, we know the nature of God. We all know Jeremiah 29, 11. God says, I know the thoughts I think towards you, not of evil, not of evil, but to give you a future and a hope. Thoughts of peace. God, God is wanting the best for us. So he prunes because, think about this, Father knows best, right? Father knows best. Now, part of the pruning, also included with that, is sometimes suffering or difficulty, right? And though we might think it's unnecessary, no, God, I really, I, I don't need to suffer. I'm certain of that, right? Who wants to do that? I'm certain I don't need to suffer. But Sometimes God is allowing it because he knows. And isn't it true, though, that when we're going through a real difficulty, some kind of suffering might be physical, it could be even emotional, it could be some kind of spiritual. But either way, you know what it does? It draws us to God. That's one thing it does do, and that's always a good thing. I love what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, 67. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. In other words, when everything was fine, I went astray. But now I'm keeping your word. Now that I'm afflicted, now that I'm dealing with suffering, I'm clinging closer to you, Lord, and that's good. Paul understood this concept. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he said, lest I be exalted by the abundance of revelations that God gave me. God used Paul in an incredible way. Paul says, a thorn in the flesh was given to him. A thorn in the flesh. Ugh. Can you imagine that? A messenger of Satan, of course, even. God allowed this in his life. Lest I be exalted above measure. And I asked the Lord three times, Lord, would you take this away? Take it away, take it away. And God said, no, no, no. My grace is sufficient for you. And Paul came to understand that well, that's okay, God. Your grace is sufficient. And when I'm weak, you are strong. And it causes me to lean on you. And it's all good. So I can bear more fruit. So God will allow that. So he does pruning. Another part of the pruning process is that he'll use his word. Look at verse 3. And you're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. God will often use his word to prune us, to take things away, or even to build us up. C.H. Spurgeon had some great words on this. He said, it is the word that prunes the Christian. 
It is the truth that purges him. The scriptures made living and powerful by the Holy Spirit effectually cleanse the believer. And it does tell us that in Ephesians 5, 26. It calls it the washing of the water of the word. And I have found that God's word plays a vital role in convicting me, pruning me, and also at other times encouraging me and building mud, all of which allow me to bear fruit. And so Jesus brings up this concept, and in light of that, he says in verse 4, then you need to abide in me, and I in you. Now, this word abide, uh, the Greek word is meno, very simple word, and it means just to stay with or remain, to remain, to stay, stay put. For example, it's used, this very word's used in Acts chapter 27 and verse 31, when Paul is shipwrecked, you're maybe familiar with the story, and, and it says this, except these men, meno, stay in the ship, we won't be saved. It means they, they need to stay and they need to remain. It's also used in John 8, 31. We're familiar with this verse. Jesus says, if you continue, meno, or remain in my word, then you prove you're my disciples. So the idea is remaining, staying with, being faithful to, and how we need to stay and remain in Christ. Notice he adds in verse 4, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. So that's very obvious. That's self-explanatory, right? We get it. A branch left to itself, not attached to the vine, has no life in itself. It's going to die. It cannot produce fruit. All of the fruit has to come from what's derived from the vine. But if the branch is detached from the vine, it cannot bear fruit. It must be connected. Thus, a branch left to itself is dead. It's lifeless. So the application is pretty obvious. Jesus is saying, apart from me, you can't produce anything. You can't have no spiritual fruit that would be acceptable before me or before the Father. How important it is we remind ourselves of that, right? We are nothing in ourselves. All of our energy, all of our strength, our sustenance, our resource, it all comes from the Lord. It's all Him. And so Jesus then reiterates this. Again, he wants it to be clear. I think we understand it. Look at verse 5. And so he, he summarizes, says, I am the vine, and you're the branches. Do you understand now? He who abides in me, and I in him, will bear much fruit. So if you just stay connected, remain, stay with me, you'll bear fruit. For without me, you can do what? A few things. Well, you can do something. No, no. For without me, you can do nothing. How about that? Nothing. Now, in, this has two implications. First of all, in regard to salvation. Without the Lord interacting in our lives, we can't do anything to save ourselves. We can't, we're never going to be good enough. I mean, Romans 3.23 says, we all sin, we come short of the glory of God. And we've talked about that before, giving you various examples of that. Let's suffice to say, no one is perfect. We're not going to make it on our own effort. Ephesians 2.8 and 9 then tells us, that we have to be saved by grace. By grace, we're saved through faith. Lord, I, I need you. That and of ourselves, it's a gift. It's a gift of grace, the gift of God. It's not of works, nothing I can do, lest I would boast and say, what a great guy I am. No. Salvation is all of God, by the grace of God. But secondly, there's also this element that we need to understand that once I am saved... Once the Lord has worked in my life, if I want to bear fruit, I, I have to do it only, and I can only do it as I abide in him. I can't do it apart from him. Anything that I would try and attempt to do apart from Jesus it is, is spiritually futile and eternally insignificant. I mean, I, I have to remain and attach to Jesus. I have to abide in him. Now, one question that comes out when you're looking at a passage like this is, well, we're talking about people that could be saved, not saved. We gave an example of Judas. How do we know if a person is saved or not? How do you know if a person is connected to Jesus or maybe it's just superficial? Well, because of what Jesus says here in verse 5. He who abides in, I, in me and I in him will bear fruit. How do I know if a person is Christian? They're going to bear fruit. This is very simple but very important to understand. There is no such thing as a fruitless Christian. There's no such thing, right? Now, you may have to look hard in some people's lives, right? Well, I have to look pretty hard. Is there fruit, you know? 
Listen, if I can't do anything apart from Jesus, then the only way I can bear fruit is be connected to him. Therefore, if I'm connected to him, I'm going to bear fruit. Now, the question is, what constitutes fruit? We're talking about fruit here. What is fruit? I mean, that's a good, that's a fair question. What is fruit? Well, let me tell you a few things that it's not. Fruit is not success. Because sometimes people, well, look at how successful they are. Look how successful she is. I mean, look at, that must be fruit. God's blessing them. Well, not really. Not necessarily. Hey, the Mormon church is very successful. They've taken a false message around the world. They are successful in doing that. They're totally wrong. That's not heavenly fruitful. That's not spiritual fruit. Another thing that's not fruit is it's not it's not measured by emotionalism because there are some people who get, man, that person must be really on fire for God because they sure are excited. But you could be excited about the wrong thing or you could be excited and not saved. You know, just because a person does a lot of shouting and hollering doesn't mean they're abiding in Christ. It doesn't matter how high you jump in church. It's how straight you walk once you get out, right? <laughs> I don't mind if you jump and raise your hands. That's all good, but you understand the point. Because there are a lot of people that get real emotional once a week, but the other six days of the week, they, they live like the devil. So what is fruit? Well, I think in a general, well, a general definition of, of fruit would definitely be Christ-likeness. I, I definitely think that's safe to say. It's Christ-likeness. I mean, if I am abiding in Christ and Christ abiding in me, I, I'm then going to bring forth fruit that is Christ-like. That's why we're called Christians, but what does that look like? Or is that described somewhere in the Bible? Yes, it is. Best description is found in Galatians 5.22. And it uses the term fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of being born again, the life of God working in my life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, right? And, and think about this. As we look at the life of Jesus, these were all personified in the life of Christ. As we see Christ, we see love personified. If we look at Christ, we see joy personified. We see the peace of God personified. Jesus said, my peace I give to you, and, and so forth. And so if we're going to bear forth Christ's likeness, certainly we're going to see the fruit of the Spirit coming out of our life. Now, I think there are other descriptions of fruit in the New Testament, so let me give you a few other ones. Genuine worship that flows out of the life of a believer, that's fruit. We know that because Hebrews 13, 15 says, let us continually offer up the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And Jesus did say to the woman at the well, remember he said, you know, uh, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And the Father is seeking such to worship him. God wants that. And, and the, the book of Hebrews tells us that we should be giving that fruit from our lips. And when a person is truly born again, they're abiding in Christ, that will come out of their life. Worship will flow out of their life, truly. I would also say giving to the Lord is fruit that comes out of our life. As Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, in Philippians 4, 17, he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds towards you. And so giving to the Lord is fruit that comes out of our life. It's this sign of maturity and surrender and trust in God that comes when a person is born again. Fourthly, we could also say that sharing our faith is fruit because Jesus gave that in an analogy. For example, when Jesus saw all the crowds coming to him in the Gospel of John chapter 4 and verse 35, he said to the disciples, look up, lift up your eyes and look, for the fields are white for harvest. He, he saw lost humanity as those needing to be harvested. And then he said this in the next verse to the disciples, he who gathers and saves these people gathers fruit unto eternal life. That's fruit when we seek to share with lost people. And then finally, I would say, knowing God's word, better yet, obeying God's word, that's fruit. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint. Pastor Ron is teaching through the Gospel of John. Almost all scholars, both Christians and non-Christians, agree that Jesus was a real person. But was he in fact the Son of God? Was Jesus just a man, or was he actually divine? The Apostle John starts the book by stating in no uncertain terms that Jesus existed ever since the beginning and that he is God. 
It was because Jesus claimed to be God that he was murdered by the Jewish religious leaders. Who do you say Jesus is? Do you believe that he is the Son of God? If you have any questions about what you heard today, we'd be happy to speak with you or even connect with you on our website. You can reach us at 281-648-5800. That number again is 281-648-5800. If you'd rather connect on our website, go to ltlradio.org and scroll to the bottom of the page. There, you'll find a form you can fill out to connect. We'd love to hear from you. Larger Than Life is the radio ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint. To hear more messages like this one, head over to ltlradio.org. You can even download our mobile app to access all of Pastor Ron's teachings. Once more, all you need to know is ltlradio.org. Thanks for joining us today on Larger Than Life.